Hello. This worship service is brought to you by Divinity Lutheran Church and St. John Lutheran Church on the east side of St. Paul. Thank you for joining us. It's the second Sunday of Easter. The worship theme for us today is that Jesus lives to give me proof and peace. We begin by singing our first hymn, Christ the Lord is Risen Today. Alleluia. Father, 
I confess that I am by nature sinful, and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil, and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O risen Lord, you came to your disciples and took away their fears with your word of peace. Come to us also by your word and sacrament and banish our fears with the comforting assurance of your abiding presence. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. gospel lesson for the second Sunday of Easter is taken from the Gospel of St. John, chapter 20, beginning with the 19th verse. Glory be to you, o Lord. On the evening of that first day of the week, the disciples were together behind locked doors because of their fear of the Jews. Jesus came, stood among them, and said to them, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and side. So the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you, just as the Father has sent me, I am also sending you. After saying this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Whenever you forgive people's sins, they are forgiven. Whenever you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. But Thomas, one of the twelve, the one called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples kept telling him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger into the mark of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will never believe. After eight days, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them. Peace be with you, he said. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, and look at my hands. Take your hand, and put it into my side. Do not continue to doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen, and yet have believed. Jesus, in the presence of his disciples, did many other miraculous signs that are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Praise be to you, o Christ. It's now time for the children's sermon. Hi. I know you can't see me very well right now because it's dark. Does that remind you of last week when we talked about Jesus' tomb and how it was dark and how dark caves can be scary? Well, a cave that's scary can be made not scary 
if someone can just turn on a light. See, now that's not that's not scary at all, is it? In fact, it's it's really pretty. Just by adding some light, something that was scary becomes not scary. On Easter Sunday night, Jesus' disciples were in a room with the doors locked. It was dark, and they were very scared. They had the doors locked because they were afraid that Jesus' enemies were going to hurt them, just like they had hurt Jesus. But then all of a sudden, just like flipping a light switch, Jesus was in the room with them. He had come back to life, and he came to them to tell them, I'm, I'm alive. He said, peace be with you. They didn't need to be scared, and they weren't. But one of the disciples, a man named Thomas, wasn't there. And so later when the disciples told him about this, when they said, Jesus is alive, and he came to us, and we saw him, and we talked to him, Thomas said he didn't believe it. This is a fish tank or an aquarium behind me. Well, at least that's what I'm telling you, right? You know, it actually could be a TV. I could have a TV on behind me with an aquarium on the TV, with fish on the TV. How could I prove to you that this is really an aquarium and not a TV? Well, I suppose one way is I could do this. Stick my hand in the water. And now watch. There. See the, the water dripping off my hands? Now you know that that's really an aquarium. An even better way would be is if you could be here in my house and you could touch the aquarium and the water and maybe even the fish, then you would know for sure. Well, Jesus did something kind of like that to prove to Thomas that he really was alive. He came again and he told Thomas to touch him to feel him so that he would know that Jesus is really alive, to, to touch his hands where they had been hurt by the nails that held him to the cross. And Jesus did that because he loved Thomas. He wanted Thomas to believe in him and to know that, that he really is alive. You and I, right now, we can't touch Jesus like Thomas could. But we can read the Bible, we can listen to our parents tell us about Jesus and know that he's really alive. And someday, we will be able to touch Jesus. Someday when we get to heaven, Jesus is going to hug us because he is very much alive. The epistle lesson is taken from St. Peter's first epistle, chapter 1, beginning with the third verse. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, he gave us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, into an inheritance that is undying, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. Through faith you are being protected by God's power for the salvation that is ready to be revealed at the end of time. Because of this you rejoice very much, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various kinds of trials, so that the proven character of your faith, which is more valuable than gold, which passes away even though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him now, yet by believing in him, you are filled with a joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory because you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. This is the word of the Lord. Let's confess our faith with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven 
and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And sing the great Easter hymn, I Know That My Redeemer Lives, the first five verses. situation 
the, I don't know, I guess you could call him a cultural commentator, said that this now, this pandemic, is the end of what he called the great nap. And his definition of the great nap is the time period from the end of World War II until now. And the point he makes is that that time period, relatively speaking, was pretty peaceful. Now, certainly there was suffering. There were things like the Vietnam War and terrorism. But if you compare that time period to pretty much all the rest of human history, it does seem like there's maybe something to this. Now, none of us have experienced the kind of you know, society or worldwide suffering that was endured during the Great Depression when 25% of people were unemployed. Or the Black Death, which some estimates say killed half the people in Europe. Relatively speaking, compared to that, we maybe have had it kind of easy. We haven't had a whole lot to worry about. Is that time period over? Are we now going to to suffer on a society-wide level like, like many people have done throughout the history of the world. Perhaps, maybe, maybe not. But even, even if we are, St. Peter's point to us today is that you can still be happy. Even when there's great suffering around you, even when you yourself are enduring great suffering, you can still be happy. The people that Peter was, was writing to certainly understood intense suffering, the kind of suffering that most of us have not experienced. These were Christians, obviously, living in present-day Turkey. And they were um, Gentile Christians, which means um, all of this was new to them. You know, they were not... Jewish people who had, had, had been raised to know the Old Testament and to know the true God, for, for these folks, even the concept of there being only one God was a, a very new idea. So we could maybe think of them as, as baby Christians. But on top of that, they were experiencing true, intense persecution. In, intense enough that Peter refers to it more than once in this letter. This, this is a big deal. This is on their minds. Um, it's, it's on Peter's mind. And still, Peter makes a point to them that you know, they could be happy. One thing that makes me happy, one thing that I am thankful for, is that in the Lutheran Church, we do, uh, we have been taught to understand that faith is a gift from God, that it's not a decision a person makes. Why, why am I happy about that? Why am I thankful for that? Well, for a number of reasons. First of all, it keeps the focus on God instead of on me. If, if I choose God, if faith is a decision I make, then really I'm giving some of the credit to myself. Well, look at me. I'm better than those poor slobs over there. I actually, I actually believe in Jesus. All glory. All honor, all credit should go to God. Another reason I'm thankful for, for our understanding of that is, is that if faith is a decision I make, well, boy, I can change my mind pretty easily, can't I? When a depression hits, when a friend gets sick, when a pandemic strikes, when I lose my job, whatever it is, Boy, it would be really easy then to just choose not to believe anymore. But if faith is something given to us by God, that means God protects that gift. God protects our faith. He nourishes our faith. And, and Peter refers to that here. He says, through faith, you are being protected by God's power. Faith is something God has given me. Faith is something God wants me to continue to have, and so he will protect it. Now, I can certainly do damage. It is still possible to lose faith. 
But that's an entirely different situation than faith simply being a decision that I make. But another reason that we should be thankful that we understand this is that it's just more evidence than of God's love. If faith is a gift from God, you know, it's, it's, it's not enough that he sent his son to die for me. He also is the one who gives me faith in Jesus' sacrifice, trust in God's great love for me. Let me read again the first verse from our lesson. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, he gave us a new birth into a living hope. By his great mercy, he gave us a new birth into a living hope. It's not something we deserve. It's simply God's mercy. And it's an, a, a beautiful phrase that St. Peter uses, isn't it? For faith, a living hope. Faith in God is not simply acknowledgement that God exists. It's not even simply acknowledgement that Jesus is, is God's son, and then he died on the cross and rose again. Faith is not simply information. It is a living hope. It's something that, well, I'm getting a bit ahead of myself, but it's, it's that thing through which we receive salvation. So Peter's point to, to his original readers and to us is this is a reason for us to be happy. And we can always be happy even in the midst of suffering when we recognize that God has made us trust in him and he's going to protect and nurture that faith. I've mentioned suffering more than once. Peter mentions it here. And by the way, really read through this and be amazed that this is the appointed lesson for today. All about having joy and hope even in the midst of suffering. How perfect is this for our time? The exact reference uh, that, that Peter makes to suffering. Because of this you rejoice very much even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various kinds of trials. What is there about suffering that could possibly make us happy? Well, God uses suffering to refine our faith. Peter makes this reference to how, how gold is, is refined in fire. God can and does use suffering and trials to refine our faith. I am positive a number of you have already experienced this because a number of you have mentioned this to me. How much uh, th this time that we're going through has helped you to refocus on what really matters. How many of us are concerned um, about economic damage being caused and how much worse it can be? So what I'm about to say could very well be different in, in a couple of months. But my wife and I have both noticed that um, we have more money right now. Uh, we're not spending as much money. I think a lot of us have noticed that. We're just, we're not spending as much. Which means, doesn't it, that a lot of what we spent our money on was certainly not essential. Now, these are things we didn't really need. That helps us to focus on, okay, what, what do we really need? What is really important? There's two ways a person can respond to suffering. As Job's friends told him, you can curse God and die, or you can let that pain push you towards God, to turn to him. There's so much that's out of our control, isn't there? I think for a lot of us, that's one of the most difficult things about, about what we're experiencing right now. We can't control it. It's, it's just something we, we've got to endure. But God is in control. I can't do anything to affect what's going to happen, but I can trust in my God. I can turn to him and know that, well, he loved me enough to send his son to die for me. He loved me enough to give me faith in that. I shouldn't doubt. Now, we are quick to do so. We are quick to question God. And so God uses 
pain. He uses suffering to refine our faith. So suffering is actually something that we can be happy about because God will use it to strengthen our faith. But we can also be happy about it because God can use that suffering to make our faith and our God then evident to others. What, what exactly is Peter talking about here when he says, um, I'll back up a little bit, read a little bit of what I already have and then keep going. You have been grieved by various kinds of trials. So that the proving character of your faith, which is more valuable than gold, which passes away even though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Who is this praise, honor, and glory for? Is Peter talking about how we might actually receive some praise and honor and glory from God for, for trusting in him? That's possible. That's not an unbiblical thought. But it's certainly true that God receives praise and honor and glory when people recognize the faith that he has given to us. When we endure pain and suffering and don't turn our back on God. I think a lot of us are, are really feeling the effects of all this social distancing. We're not around other people. We miss having conversations. We miss shaking hands, patting people on the back, seeing someone when they talk to us, hearing their laugh in, in person. But we should be thankful that God has given us still some ways to communicate. Social media, for all the negative effects it can have, has been a real blessing for many of us during this time. I've had a conversation with, with some other pastors, and a lot of us are noticing something. It, it's really been amazing how so many churches have, have scrambled and reinvented how they've done ministry over the last month, and churches like ours that weren't doing a, a, a whole lot with technology are doing more. Many, many churches are putting their uh, videos of their worship services online. And we have noticed the people who are most liking these videos and sharing them with others seem to be the older generation. There's a blessing there and maybe something to be concerned about, right? Some of these people are people that we would not have thought would even be comfortable with this kind of technology, but they become comfortable. The thing that concerns us is, boy, the young folks who you think are probably seeing all this, why aren't they sharing it? And maybe it just hasn't occurred to some of us that clicking a like button, clicking a share button is one of the ways right now that we can let others know about God's love. That we can share our faith with others. That we can demonstrate our faith so that God receives praise and honor and glory. It's as easy as sharing various Christian resources online. There's so much out there that we can share. So if you haven't done that, I encourage you to do so. Click a like button. Click a share button. Let other people in your life know the peace and joy that you have. You can be happy even in the midst of suffering because God uses that suffering to bring honor and glory to himself. You can also be happy because the faith that God has given you, well, it has a goal. The, uh, the reference to, uh, the main reference to joy here, there's a couple of them, but the main one, Peter writes, you are filled with, with a joy that is inexpressible. Um, I like, that's a good translation. The, the, the really literal one is Peter is basically just piling up a whole bunch of terms to express how happy we are. He says, you are overjoyed with a joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. Why is this joy inexpressible? It's just, it's not the kind of happy you feel uh, about getting a present on your birthday. It's, it's not the kind of happy of, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, uh, like for me, I'm going to go fishing. Or those of you that play golf, the golf courses are opening again, and you're happy about that. This is just a whole nother level. 
Joy overfilled with, with joy that is inexpressible. Why? What makes this joy different? Because your faith has a goal. And here the AHP just really nails this translation. You are filled with a joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory because you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. At least so far, this COVID-19 pandemic is still pales in comparison to the, the Spanish flu of about 100 years ago. Historians who write about that, that pandemic have a difficult time. They have a difficult time of finding first-hand resources, first-hand accounts, which is what historians always want, want to find. And I recently read a fascinating theory as to why this is. People who lived through it didn't talk about it. They didn't write about it. Why? Because that pandemic was so bad that a lot of people became rather selfish. They became really focused on just protecting themselves and maybe their immediate family. And they turned their back on others who were suffering, others who needed help. And when they survived, when it was all over, they were ashamed of themselves. That all sounds pretty believable, doesn't it? Whatever happens with, with this illness, some of us are going to fail to live lives that really bring glory to God. We are not going to take advantage of the opportunities that God gives us. There will be times where we could show love and mercy to someone suffering and we're too selfish or too lazy or too self-centered and, and we won't do it. We'll miss that opportunity and, and perhaps sometime later we will be ashamed and Maybe we won't want to tell our grandkids about what 2020 and 2021 were like. Your faith has a goal. The goal of your faith is salvation. My friends, when those things happen, when you fail to love others perfectly, you are saved. You have forgiveness for that sin. And not because... Well, it's understandable. You know, people are scared. People love their families. It's, it's understandable that we, we maybe would turn our back on others. No, there's no excusing sin. You're saved because of Jesus. You're saved because he always loved and always helped those who needed it. You're saved because Jesus sacrificed himself for you and for the whole world. So you can be happy. You can be happy in, in the midst of suffering because your faith has a goal. Salvation. Be happy. That doesn't mean you have to whistle all the time and always have a smile on your face. Not that kind of happy. A deep, inexpressible, abiding joy that God loves you and everything is going to be okay. Amen. And now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times and in every way. Amen. If you would like to support the ministries of Divinity Lutheran Church and St. John Lutheran Church, uh, the various ways in which you can do so are on your screen right now. You can mail checks to either churches. Uh, with Divinity, we also have an online option. Uh, just go to our website and you can give through PayPal, and we certainly appreciate your support. We also appreciate your prayers. Uh, we appreciate how you are, are looking after each other in all sorts of, of different ways. And we pray. Heavenly Father, you have given dignity and value to honest labor. 
We commend to your care all who are unemployed and unable to find satisfying work. Do not forget or forsake them. Keep them from bitterness and frustration and help them cast their cares on you. Graciously supply their physical needs from day to day. Encourage them as they seek work and in, in your mercy increase the opportunities for employment in our land. Give us all the spirit of love that willingly bears one another's burdens and shows itself in genuine concern for one another's needs. For the sake of Jesus, whose compassion never fails, and who taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Close by singing the last three verses of I Know That My Redeemer Lives. your sacrificial love for them, so that their love for each other may never grow weary. With every joy and sorrow that they share, bring them closer to each other and to you, their God and Lord. Encourage all husbands and wives as they seek to fulfill their marriage promises, and bless all our homes with your abiding peace. Amen. Have a wonderful week.
If you appreciate these videos, please like and subscribe to our Divinity Lutheran YouTube page.